Well, this classic book series that was super popular when I was in middle school is now coming out with a brand new book. So I figured it's time for me to finally jump on the bandwagon. That's right, today and for the next few weeks, I am going to be reading the Percy Jackson series for the first time ever. Now the Percy Jackson series is a series that was, like I said, super popular when I was in the target demographic, but I never actually read them. My only real experience with it is I have memories of watching the movie at school one day just because they put on a movie instead of teaching us, I don't know. But within the book community, you are gonna be hard pressed to find people who aren't big fans of the Percy Jackson series. And with the new TV show that came out last year and the new book that came out last year and the new book that's coming out later this year, this series lives on in popularity. People really, really like it. So I'm really excited to give it a read. I am only going to be reading the first five books in the series. The sixth one just came out last year and I'm not gonna be counting that as part of this because it wouldn't have been out when this book's were originally super popular. But having said all of that, I'm gonna dive right in with the first book, which is The Lightning Thief. Um, and I'm gonna just say this right now, this book is in terrible shape. I, did, I, I didn't do this, I swear. It was like this when I got it. So I just finished the first chapter and I wanted to pause there for a moment just because this is the point where I no longer know what's going to happen in the book. My only real experience with the story of Percy Jackson is from watching the movie in middle school, and I don't even think we watched the entire thing. As Percy and Grover are running away, they come across these three old ladies with knitting needles and string, which are clearly meant to represent the three fates from Greek mythology. And I think this is a really good time to point out how much I love the way that Greek mythology is incorporated in this series. They're incorporated in a way that modernizes it without making it super cheesy and still has a really good effect. Can I just say that I really, really like Percy as a character. I think he's a very sweet boy. I love his relationship with his mom, how much he cares for her and loves her. And I also really love his relationship with Grover. I mean, he's now discovered that Grover is actually part goat and that he's been lying to him and he's been protecting him. But I love the fact that his first thought is, oh, I've been protecting him. And when he gets expelled, he doesn't want to leave because he's worried about what's going to happen to Grover and how Grover's going to survive. I just finished chapter four and I kind of wish that I had been recording myself reading it because Percy's mom died and I'm devastated because I was just talking about how much I loved her. She was amazing. That chapter just really sets up kind of what we're going to get for the rest of the book. So I already know about Annabeth and Percy's relationship because I mean it's impossible to exist on the internet without knowing it but the fact that the first time they actually interact when he's not uh, unconscious is him thinking she's gonna compliment him on how cool he is for killing a minotaur and her just going you drool when you sleep it's just so iconic and I love it. <laughs> Percy has officially arrived at Camp Half Flood and I have to say I honestly really love the first god that we meet in this series which is Dionysus. Dude's just generally the funniest person in this whole series. Quick question, how old is Grover supposed to be? Because Percy says that he looks like he's like a little bit older and then when he gets to the camp Grover says that he's been like a keeper before so how old is he supposed to be is he like hundreds of years old but he just ages super slowly Ten seconds later. never mind uh they just answered my question he's 28 that's really weird <laughs> i don't like that i don't like that grover is older than me also it's such a weird i thought he was gonna be like thousands of years old no just 28 straight Straight up just, it's just straight up just a millennial. Another piece of lore that we are introduced to that I love the idea of is the fact that the Greek gods move to wherever Western civilization is most centralized. And that's why they are in America because that's where all these statues and huge monuments are being made. So can I just say, I genuinely kind of love the lore that is being set up for this world. Cause some of it just, it's so insane that they just throw it in there 
just in passing, the implication that World War II was a fight between the children of Hades and the children of Zeus and Poseidon, which is just an insane thing to say. Annabeth told Percy that his dyslexia is because his brain is hardwired to read ancient Greek. So does that mean that every single demigod is dyslexic? Because, I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, Percy is, but no one else. So Percy finally knows who his godly parent is. He just was attacked, which is definitely against the rules of any Capture the Flag I've ever played. Someone's summoned a hellhound, but that would mean someone probably knew who he was already. So I have to wonder who, who already knew who Percy was. Maybe, maybe Dionysus? Why would he? I hope not, because he's cool. I like him. <laughs> like he's got his friends, Annabeth and Lou. I think the only person who's kind of been like really mean to him is Clarice, but I don't think it would have been Clarice because I don't know if she would have had the time. I guess I don't know what summoning a hellhound entails. Is it like a ritual casting thing? Do you need 10 minutes? <laughs> The entrance to the underworld is always in the west. It moves from age to age, just like Olympus. Right now, of course, it's in America. Where? Chiron looks surprised. I thought it, that would be obvious enough. The entrance to the underworld is in Los Angeles. <laughs> I, this, <laughs> this book is so funny sometimes. Well, Percy is now leaving camp to go on his quest to find the stolen lightning bolt, but right off the bat, he is already attacked again on a bus by his former math teacher. What follows is a series of monster encounters, starting with the main three, Grover, Annabeth, and Percy meeting Medusa, and that entire scene just has such an incredible sense of suspense before the actual fight. It's just incredibly written. After that, the three of them make their way to the gateway arch, where Percy again has to fight another Another monster, a chimera, and ends up falling into the Mississippi River. This book just really does not want to let this kid rest. I'm really enjoying it so far. I can see why people really like it. It stays action-packed. Everything is very intentional. Well, except for that poodle chapter. I mean, I guess he does have the dream in that chapter that sets up that someone needs his help escaping. I'm really enjoying the dynamic between Percy, Annabeth, and Grover. We're learning a lot about these three characters, about Grover wanting to search for Pan. Annabeth, you know, clearly has this desire to prove herself to her mother. And Percy sort of questioning his identity. I am really loving that conflict that he has where he's not at his father for abandoning him and his mother but at the same time he is a little bit proud and he does kind of want to prove himself also i want to just share a theory that i have with you guys talia the girl who's been turned into a tree i am fairly certain we're going to see her again i mean if they had just brought it up once i would have been like okay whatever but they spent a lot of time on her story which makes me think that they're drawing attention to her for a reason. After leaving St. Louis, the main three find themselves with another god, Ares, who asks them for a favor, which ends up getting them almost trapped in one of Hephaestus' traps. After this, they go to one of my favorite points in this book, which is the Lotus Casino, a place where time moves a lot slower and they are tempted to stay there forever. I just think this is such a really cool concept and I just wish we had spent more time there. I have gotta say that I am really loving the way that Rick Royden incorporates sort of the world of the Greek gods and Greek mythology into the real world. Been introduced to Ares now and Pro Christes, but having these different characters show up and also with Medusa showing up as well and the river spirit and the I am messaging. <laughs> the incorporation is really well done and I think it just creates this very almost realistic setting. I do wonder which figure is at the helm of the Lotus Casino because I thought that was really, really cool. I kind of wish we had known a little bit more about it because we have the scene with the Lotus Casino and then we don't even get told who is responsible for it. I feel like if you are writing something that is based on Greek mythology, you are required by law to include a scene with Cerberus. <laughs> and frankly, I'm not complaining. That was really, really cute. Just playing fetch with a giant 
dog. So the f magical flying shoes that Luke gave to Percy, that Percy then gave to Grover, just tried to drag him into a pit, into Tartarus. And the ocean spirit did say, don't trust the gifts. And the Oracle said that he would be betrayed by someone who called him friend. So I'm beginning to think Luke's not so great the guy. Percy meets Hades and the scene is genuinely so funny because Hades is complaining basically just about city planning, which is hilarious. Percy finds out that Hades does not have the Master Bolt and finds out that Ares does. He ends up fighting him and winning, which you go, ends up giving his mom a way to get out of her abusive relationship, which I love. After getting back to camp, Percy finds out about Luke's betrayal, and when he explains why he did it, I honestly just feel really bad for him. We've seen how much Percy struggled with his godly parent, and to see Luke, whose father has so many kids, feel so betrayed by him that he would want to betray all his friends is just really heartbreaking. All right, so I just finished The Lightning Thief. The ending I thought was very sweet, the fact that he chooses to go back to his mom. Percy kind of through this whole book is trying to figure out, you know, what's more important to him, his mom and saving his mom from Hades or, you know, siding with his father and doing this quest for his father. There's a lot of setup for the second book that they're gonna be going after Luke. It definitely finished really, really fast, but I'm really liking it so far. It's super cozy in a way and it keeps you engaged because something is happening every chapter. Well, Percy is back at school, once again being the defender of an older kind of weird kid named Tyson. He gets into a big dodgeball fight with these giant cannibals and Annabeth shows up just in the nick of time to save the day. As she should, she is the real hero of this. This isn't related to Sea of Monsters, but I was just looking up some stuff about the first Percy Jackson book, and apparently I think the Lotus Hotel or Casino is based off of the Lotus Eaters from The Odyssey. I did not know that. I've never read The Odyssey. So that is an interesting reference. I love the sentence. We'd made our peace last summer, despite the fact that her mom was Athena and I didn't get along with my dad. <laughs> Those two things don't feel like, <laughs> don't feel like they're related. <laughs> explaining to Percy what the giant cannibals that attacked him in the gym were called. Laestrigonians. And he goes, Laestri, I can't even say that. What would you call them in English? She thought about it for a moment. Canadians, she decided. I mean, <laughs> you read something like Percy Jackson, you're like, oh, where do I fit? What cabin do I fit in? Apparently, I don't fit in any of the cabins. Apparently, <laughs> I'm a gi giant cannibal. <laughs> Annabeth, Percy, and Tyson make their way to Camp Half-Blood, where they find out that Chiron has been fired because Talia's tree has been poisoned. Tyson is revealed to not only be a Cyclops, but also to be a fellow son of Poseidon. One of the jokes I don't think I'll ever get over in this book is just the way that Dionysus doesn't know Percy's name. <laughs> Well, well, if it isn't Peter Johnson, my millennium is complete. I gritted my teeth. Percy Jackson, sir. Mr. D sipped his Diet Coke. Yes, well, as you young people say these days, whatever. <laughs> I, I genuinely really like Dionysus. I think he's just really funny how much he does not care and just hates being a camp counselor. The quests in these books are the most insane things I've ever seen. In the first one, it was that someone had stolen Zeus's lightning bolt and so they had to travel to the underworld to try and get it back. In this one, it's that Grover has been trapped by a cyclops who thinks that he's a female cyclops because he's dressed himself in a wedding dress. They have to rescue him in two weeks before it figures out that he's not actually a female cyclops and eats him, I guess? Kills him? Eats him? I don't know if he is going to kill him for sport or if he's going to eat him. It would feel wasteful not to. <laughs> I know there's obviously some inspiration from Greek mythology here, but it's just such an insane prospect. I love the way that we are seeing Percy not be kind of like the golden boy anymore. He is sort of conflicted about how he feels with Tyson because he likes Tyson as his friend and he wants to look out for him, but also he is a little bit ashamed of him to be related to him. Like he was his friend until 
he realized that he was his brother. And I like that because it shows that he's able to be this complicated character. He does make mistakes and he does, you know, not always treat people the most kindly because he is, he's just a boy, he's young. And it makes it a realistic character. And I think that it's a really clever thing. Second thing, what is up with Tantalus. Who the heck is that guy? And why is he so awful? Like, <laughs> what is his deal? It feels like he's supposed to be someone that we see as suspicious, and which is why I feel like he isn't suspicious. But seriously, what is up with him? Tantalus allows them to go on a quest to find the Golden Fleece to save Talia's tree and Grover, but he makes Clarice do it instead of Percy. But that doesn't mean Percy's not going. After having a conversation with Hermes, he, Annabeth, and Tyson decide to go on a quest of their own. I just wanted to say, I'm super excited because we've just met another one of the Pantheon. Percy had a conversation with Hermes. I just get really excited whenever we meet one of them. My understanding of the show was that even in the first season, there were a bunch more of the gods who were there. And we still haven't met Hephaestus officially. We've just seen his work. <laughs> and I, I gotta say, I'm a fan. It seems like they might be going on a cruise down to the Bermuda Triangle because of course the Sea of Monsters is off the coast of Florida. I am really loving Tyson so far as a character. He reminds me a bit of Sam in The Lord of the Rings. Tyson, like Sam, is super loyal and he's just super excited about everything. Like he's so excited about finding the hippocampi. <gasps> Okay, okay, Luke is on the cruise ship that they just got on. It's already really interesting that this cruise ship seems to be, everyone is some sort of trance and there are these monsters and none of them can see them. And it reminds me a bit of the, the Lotus Hotel a bit from the first book. I thought we weren't gonna be seeing Luke until closer to the end. So the fact that he's here is, Oh, it's big. Well, Luke finds our trio and reveals that the more demigods that join him, the more that the Titan Kronos' body is formed. The three are able to escape after a fight, but they are immediately in danger again from a Hydra and are only saved by the appearance of Clarice. It seems like this book is focusing a lot more on Annabeth. Uh, obviously, it's still from Percy's point of view, but we're learning more about Annabeth as a person, more about her relationship with Talia. Um, I have a sense that maybe Talia will be coming back at the end of this book, but because this book is so focused on Luke having betrayed them and Talia's tree being poisoned, Annabeth is kind of caught in the middle there because Luke and Talia protected her when she was young. Now that Clarice has joined them, I'm hoping that she's there for a while. I think Clarice is an interesting character and I'd like to dive more into her mindset as well. Percy overhears Clarice talking to her father Ares and clearly there is some tension between them as well as some hesitation on Clarice's part due to something that Oracle said to her. They are attacked by some more monsters where the ship explodes and Tyson is killed though I'm a bit hesitant to believe that that actually happened and that he will be coming back and Annabeth and Percy are separated from the rest of the group. They find themselves on an island that seems like a normal spa until they realize that it is actually run by Cersei. One of the things I love about the Percy Jackson series so far is just how insane they are. The, the most insane stuff happens. For example, in this one, Percy got turned into a guinea pig. And the fact that the other guinea pigs are Blackbeard and his pirates and they escape on Blackbeard's ship. I love it. it these books are so much fun and I can see why people enjoy them so much. Annabeth is normally pretty level-headed and she normally makes good decisions but the decision to be like yeah I'll just listen to the sirens stupid decision to make. But I will say out of that we get a really beautiful image of the two of them in the bubble underwater. And something I've been thinking for a while reading this is that these characters don't feel like 13 year olds. They're very level headed. They make good decisions most of the time. And while they definitely do make childish decisions sometimes, they are very mature. And I think that's why I'm enjoying this book so much. They're genuinely really interesting and complex. Even though I think it was a dumb decision for Annabeth to make to want to hear the sirens, it still provided something really interesting by showing her fatal flaw of hubris and showing how she wants things to be better and how she genuinely wants to help Luke even though he's betrayed her and even though her family has turned their backs on her so many times she wants to be with them 
and it shows this really nice vulnerability of this character. Well, Percy and Annabeth have made their way to Polythemus's island, the Cyclops that has Grover captive, only to find that Clarice has also been held captive now. They make a plan which very quickly goes off the rails and ends up with a big fight and a chase scene with this giant Cyclops. What did I say? What did I say? Tyson is back? I knew he would be back. I knew he wasn't dead. I'm not gonna kill off a character in an explosion on a confederate ship. I'm so happy he's back. We do kind of get confirmation on both sides. Annabeth's fear that Cyclops are tricky and they're gonna trick you. But you also get confirmation of Percy's faith in Tyson, that not all Cyclops are like that. The most annoying thing about Clarice is not that she's a bully, it's so that she's making just genuinely really bad choices in this book. And I understand the idea is like, she's a daughter of Ares, so she's He's the god of war, he's not the god of strategy. She just doesn't pick up on the fact that Grover is pretending to not be a satyr, but then also like drawing the attention towards the ship that then sinks. Ten seconds later. Clarice just revealed what the oracle said to her, and now I kind of feel bad about commenting on her poor <laughs> self-preservation skills. Like I knew obviously that the prophecy was something bad because she didn't want to talk about it and she was kind of worried about it to her dad, but I feel a little bit bad now for commenting on how bad she is at thinking logically when it was clear she was fighting for her absolute life. <laughs> Love a good showdown with Luke on the boat again. That's super fun. Also super clever to kind of do the, the iris messaging. Are we just not going to find out anything about Tantalus? Is like his, is he just awful? Is that just the thing? <laughs> He was like weirdly cool with the camp falling apart. He just like doesn't have any agenda, he just hates them. Which, I mean, if you're gonna get a camp counselor, I'm not sure a man who made a pot at children is the best choice. I'm not sure he should be allowed near children. This is, this is the sweetest thing ever. Is Percy talking to Tyson and Tyson saying that he asked Poseidon to send him a friend because of all the monsters that were attacking him. This book often has like such weird like silliness and they lean into the silliness which I like but then there's generally these like really sweet moments. After sending Clarice back to camp with the fleece and stalling Luke by fighting him, Chiron comes to save Percy and take him back to camp where he realizes that things are starting to go back to normal as the fleece begins to work on healing Talia. I called it. I called it. I so called it that Talia was coming back. <laughs> you couldn't tell by that reaction. I just finished the Sea of Monsters. Percy thought that the prophecy about a child of one of the big three becoming a weapon to either aid or uh, destroy the Pantheon was about him because he was the only child of one of the big three. And now Talia's back, so it could be her, which makes me think that maybe we'll see one, a character who is a child of Hades because then we'll have one of each and then it really is like a who is, who's gonna, who's it gonna be? I am sad that Tyson seems to be going away. I mean, that kind of makes sense because I, I'd never heard of Tyson previously to reading this book and I've heard of most of these characters in, in some capacity. It's time for another road trip starring the Titan's Curse. Talia, Percy, and Annabeth are on a quest to find two more demigods, Nico and Bianca D'Angelo, and bring them back to Camp Half-Blood. There's this really adorable moment where Annabeth is talking about her architecture classes that she gets to take and it's just great to see her so excited and happy. When we do finally meet the D'Angelo siblings, they are attacked by a manticore and Nico's reaction to this is just so adorable. He's so excited and I immediately just love this character so much. They are saved by a 12 year old girl who turns out to be Artemis and she has brought her hunters along with her including her headhunter Zoe Nightshade. Zoe tries to convince Bianca to join Artemis's female hunters and Bianca ends up joining them leaving her brother to return to Camp Half-Blood and train on his own with Percy and Talia. One of the things that I'm really liking about this book so far is that Rick Royden is trying something new. The two previous books we've been following Percy kind of on summer vacation and then this one is set during winter break. Also it just feels very different like we're really into the swing of everything we know what's going on. In this book we are entering into relationships that already exist because 
he knows Talia now. They've become friends. And we haven't seen them become friends. We haven't kind of seen the way that Talia's had to adjust to being not a tree anymore. I think that that's gonna be a really interesting dynamic to explore. I have said it before, I will say it again. I love Nico D'Angelo. He is such a cute kid. The fact that he comes back from the video and immediately just goes, oh, you're a centaur. You're the wine guy. It's just so cute. He reminds me a lot of Tyson in that sense that there is sort of this innocence and the just excitement. But I think the main difference is that Tyson is a cyclops and he kind of knows a little bit about this world where Nico is learning about it for the first time. I also feel really bad for him with his sister just deciding to abandon him to join the hunters. Zoe, Bianca, Grover, and Talia are sent on a quest to find this monster that will either save or destroy Olympus. Percy, wanting to find Annabeth after she was taken during the fight with the Manticore, decides to try and follow them, especially after Nico asks him to keep an eye on his sister to make sure that he's safe. He follows him all the way to the Smithsonian museum where he comes across Luke and his monster army. I love this introduction to the general. The way that he's introduced with this like almost council of monsters and Luke is there by his side and he just commands such an intimidation over everyone there and it's genuinely eerie and genuinely like tense. I should throw you into the pits of Tartarus for your incompetence, the general said. I sent you to capture a child of the three elder gods and you bring me a scrawny daughter of Athena. I thought that the godly parent of Nico and Bianca was Hades because We've already got Percy, who's the son of Poseidon. We've got Talia, who's a daughter of Zeus. All we're missing is someone who's a child of Hades and it would provide like some nice balance and some mystery. That makes me think I was right. If there's one thing that he is good at, it is writing really, really good fight scenes. The Nemean lion in the Air and Space Museum. Oh my gosh, so good. His command over imagery is just so fantastic and it is just so impressive. I really like that we're getting why Bianca wanted to join the hunters because I think at first glance, it can be something that seems very selfish. You know, she and her brother just found out that they're the children of a Greek god. And instead of, you know, sticking with him, she goes off on her own. But hearing the fact that they've always been on their own and she's had to essentially raise him herself really shows I think how important it is for her to be able to have this connection to kind of figure out who she wants to be. So this chapter is called We Visit the Junkyard of the Gods and I'm really hoping that we're gonna be meeting Hephaestus because we've been teased with Hephaestus being important for so long. They have to get something from a trap that Hephaestus has laid. We see a lot of Beckendorf, who is one of the children of Hephaestus, and the fact that Tyson is working in the um, forges that Hephaestus has made. I mean, junkyard, I'm picturing like metalworking. I just really want to meet this guy. I don't think we've had another one be mentioned as often and have so much of an indirect influence on the story. And I would just love to meet him. <gasps> Bianca and Nico were at the Lotus Hotel. So wait, okay, wait, hold on. So hold on. If they were at the Lotus Hotel, so they were there for clearly a long time, 70 years at least, but she doesn't know what time it is currently. So would that have just been recent? They were probably there at the same time that Percy and Annabeth and Grover were there. Oh, that's so good. A man came and said it was time to leave and that is, okay, so who was that then? We got suspense now. Oh, I'm excited. So much is happening in such a short period of time. Percy is brought into a car with Ares. But, oh, by the way, Ares is here now. Aphrodite's in the car. Pick the most beautiful actress you can think of. The goddess was 10 times more beautiful than that. Pick your favorite hair color, eye color, whatever. The goddess had that. When she smiled at me just for a moment, she looked a little bit like Annabeth. That is so cute. We've not really gotten any sort of like real romantic stuff between Percy and Annabeth. And I know that there's, it's there, but this is like 
as far as I remember, the first time we're getting something really clearly that he likes her. He thinks she's like the most beautiful person she's ever he's ever seen. When before they've kind of been teasing and it's cute and everything, but that's so sweet. I might just have to start shipping them. Okay, well, I'm several years too late for that. Aphrodite and I on the same page. <laughs> her saying, why are you here? And he's like, Artemis. And then just like, no, I'm interested in why you're here. And that's Annabeth is in trouble. Aphrodite beamed. Exactly. I have to help her. I said, I have been having these dreams. Oh, you even dream about her. That's so cute. Oh, <laughs> uh, girl, girl, you and I are on the same page here. <laughs> I appreciate you. Aphrodite reveals to Percy that she's the one who sent him on this mission as she sees it as a quest for true love, which honestly, same girl, you're doing great work. They make their way to the Hoover Dam where Percy has to fight some more monsters and meets a strange mortal named Rachel Elizabeth Dare who can see through the mists. They're only able to escape these monsters by Talia calling on her godly parent, Zeus, to bring some automaton angels to life to save them. They fly their way to San Francisco where they find out the truth about their quest. So the idea that the monster that Artemis is hunting is not actually a threat, but is actually just the little cow serpent that Percy saved earlier is such a good plot twist. They've been operating under the assumption that there's like some sort of terrible monster that they're gonna need to kill, and now they only find out that killing this creature is exactly what brings about the destruction. I also really like that Talia is being tempted by this. The girls in this novel are in very difficult positions. You got Bianca, who was so tired of being responsible for her brother her whole life that she's tempted to, to go off and join the hunters. We've got Zoe, who betrayed her family to help a hero. Talia, who feels abandoned by her father, who is very tempted by the idea of being reunited with Luke. And I think that that's really interesting because in the first book, it was very much just very fun, episodic. In the second book, we got to see more of Annabeth and we got to really see Annabeth's struggle with being a daughter of Athena, being a demigod. And then in this book we are really focusing on Talia primarily but we're also looking at Zoe and Bianca and a little bit of Grover. We've had a little bit of progress on his goal of fine pan but it's been primarily Talia. Despite the fact that this is a Percy Jackson series, Percy is very much a small part of the story and allows them to be very complicated and in depth and interesting. It's a section of fathers as we finally meet Annabeth's dad who agrees to come and help them save her and we make our way back to Zoe's home where we discover that her father is the Titan Atlas who is also the general and has trapped Annabeth on his curse of holding the sky on her shoulders all this time. There is a massive fight that breaks out with Percy having to take the weight of the world on his shoulders himself for a bit and they eventually win. However, not without some losses. I mean, this is... You're not allowed to take something like Percy Jackson and put absolutely devastating last words in someone's death. Zoe's last words being, stars, I can see the stars again, my lady, is just the most devastating thing I've ever... It's devastating. Why would they do this to me? Rick, why would you do this to me? I didn't even know I cared this much about Zoe. Why would you do this to me? Also absolutely devastating, Luke falling off the cliff. Like the imagery of Luke falling off and just like his broken body at the, at the bottom of this cliff is devastating, especially because they had this setup right before that of how there's clearly more going on. That like, it's very possible that he has just been tempted by these things and he's as afraid as they are and there's a chance for redemption. Our heroes make their way to Olympus, but instead of being celebrated, they are threatened as Talia and Percy could potentially be the heroes from the prophecy that will cause the end of Olympus. Talia is safe by becoming a hunter for Artemis and not aging, but Percy is still in danger. They eventually make their way back to camp while they immediately have to start preparing for the fight that Luke will eventually be bringing to them. So that is the Titan's curse and I'm so pleased with myself because I was right and Nico and Bianca were children of Hades, but interestingly they were before 
the oath that they made because they were trapped in the Lotus Casino for so long. Nico is upset with Percy because he blames him for his sister dying. I don't know if he would necessarily join Luke. I love that Percy's fatal flaw is revealed by Athena as being his personal loyalty to his friends. So it's been a minute since I've been reading Percy Jackson, but returning to it honestly feels like watching an episode of a sitcom where like guest stars show up and everyone just starts clapping before they've done anything. First, Percy is reunited with Rachel Elizabeth Thayer, who saves him at the school, which I feel like she is definitely important. And also the name Rachel Elizabeth Dare, the letter spell out red. I don't know if that's relevant. And then we're reunited with Tyson at the camp, which is so exciting. And then we are pseudo reunited with Nico uh, in the sense that we see him in the Iris message, planning on trying to bring back Bianca and being told by a ghost that he needs to kill someone to bring him to bring her back. It's very clear to me that like all the pieces that have been planted in previous books are just coming together. After discovering an entrance to the camp that Luke may try to use through the labyrinth, they decide to send Annabeth on a quest along with Percy, Grover, and Tyson to try and find Daedalus, the creator of the labyrinth, to try and convince him to join their side before Luke gets there. Also, what is up with this camp and hiring sketchy counselors? Because Quintus is just really sketchy. I'm really intrigued by Percy's ability to kind of walk through dreams because as far as I'm aware, that's not a Poseidon thing. Like, I don't know my Greek mythology that well. Percy is just able to, like, f find relevant plot points <laughs> through his dreams. And I'm really curious as to why that is. And I'm wondering if there's, like, something else about him that makes him special. Like, he's not just a sign of Poseidon. There's something else going on. Nico raising Theseus genuine shock when that happened. <laughs> Curious about how he learned to do that? Like, Nico left eight months, four months, less than a year. How has he already learned how to, like, raise skeletons to do his bidding and, like, raise the dead to talk to them? Like, how does he know how to do that? I don't know. Maybe it's the person that he's with. I'm hoping that we get a reveal of who that is soon because much like the general in the previous book, they are not really revealing who this big mysterious figure is. Into the labyrinth, they are already not having a good time as they come across the troublemaking minor god Janus, as well as Hera, who is not very happy with Annabeth. They make their way to Alcatraz, where they have to fight another one of Luke's massive monsters, and eventually find their way to a ranch run by Garion, a monster from the Hercules story, who they also find is hosting Nico. We've already reconnected with Nico and I'm a little bit surprised too that he seems to think that Percy wants to kill him. That's an interesting reaction to me because as far as I was aware Nico was sort of angry at Percy and wanted to kill him but he didn't think that Percy was trying to kill him. I also really like that Percy makes this deal with Garion to try and free Nico. I think Percy is just an interesting character because he is at his core like a really caring character and he has this forgiveness and he understands that Nico is not doing this stuff because he's a bad person. He's doing it because he lost his sister and he's devastated by that. We also got a reveal of who the ghost is which is the ghost of Minos, who had Daedalus and Icarus trapped in his castle. So that is a good little tie back of what the relevance of Percy's previous dreams were. One of the things that I find super interesting about this book series is that they use this book to kind of tackle different ideas that are important in the real world. For example, going to Garion's ranch and finding out that he has these endangered creatures but he's selling their eggs for food and he's giving away stuff to anyone who will pay the highest price. And it's a really interesting commentary and reveal for kids who might not know about this kind of stuff of the kind of things that people do in the real world. And that's a really interesting kind of commentary that I didn't expect to be included in this book. I love how this book series will have me like marvel at how mature and well written it is only to immediately follow up with talking about how silly it is. A fight where Percy is fighting against someone who is using barbecuing equipment against him. It's just really funny. 
<laughs> Percy helps Nico summon Bianca, who tells him that she's the one who's been revealing what Nico's been doing, and tells Nico that his fatal flaw is holding grudges and he needs to let her go. Back in the labyrinth, they come across a quiz show hosting Sphinx who attacks them, giving a whole new meaning to the chase, and eventually come across Hephaestus's garage, which I'm so glad to finally be meeting him. He tells them that he wants to figure out who's been using his forges and sends them on this mission to find it. However, after sensing Pan, Grover and Tyson split off from Percy and Anna Beth to go find Pan, while the two of them continue to the forge, finding out that the person who is using it is a group of Talkines, or sea demons, who have decided to side with Kronos. In one chapter, so much happens. This book has given me everything that I have been asking for. I wanted Tyson to come back. I'm happy he's back and I love that he and Grover have hesitant friendship and Grover tries to protect him earlier and now he's volunteering to go with Grover to help him try and find Pan. Adorable. I love him. We finally meet Hephaestus. I have been asking to meet Hephaestus since the first book and I'm really excited that we finally met him and I really like him. I like that he's just sort of this like grisly man who lives in his garage and just doesn't trust anyone. <laughs> Annabeth and Percy kissed. Annabeth kissed him before he uh, got her to escape from the Talkines. I love the banter that the two of them have. I love how much they want to protect each other. I mean, I'd heard of Perkabeth going into this. Is it Perkabeth or Percibeth? I've always pronounced it Perkabeth in my head whenever I've seen it, but I'm just now realizing that it might be Percibeth because his name is Percy Jackson. Percy destroys the Talkines by summoning a massive wall of water from inside him, but this causes him to basically disappear. He ends up on Calypso's island to try and heal, but his friends all think that he's dead because he's been there for a while. I promised you the way to Daedalus. Well, now here's the thing. It has nothing to do with Ariadne's string. Not really. Sure, the string works. That's what the Titan's army will be after. But the best way through the maze Theseus had the princess's help, and the princess was a regular mortal, not a drop of god blood in her, but she was clever and she could see, lad. She could see very clearly, so what I'm saying, I think you know how to navigate the maze. Rachel Elizabeth there. I knew she was gonna be important. One of the things that these books do really well is humanize these figures from Greek myth. I think the perfect example of that is Calypso, who reveals to Percy that her curse is that she's alone and they sometimes send her a companion who she will fall in love with but can't stay with her. And we've only known Calypso for like one chapter. Like it shouldn't really affect us, but that is really sad. Like I actually felt really genuinely moved by it. To make you feel that sadness and to feel so human. These characters that are these like larger than like Greek myths is such an amazing achievement. After reuniting with his friends, Percy is able to convince Rachel to help them navigate through the maze. They come across Luke and his army trying to entertain an arena master named Antaeus, who is another son of Poseidon, by forcing Percy to fight some monsters. They eventually are able to escape and find Daedalus's workshop, where they find out that Quintus is actually Daedalus himself. They are reunited with Nico, who's brought in as a prisoner by Minos, and end up escaping using the updated wings that Daedalus created for his son. Icarus. Okay, for real, who is Rachel? Because she just is able to go up to like the chauffeur and get a car from him. Is she like the president's daughter or something? What is going on? Back in the labyrinth, they find a tunnel to the Titan's palace where Percy finds out the sad truth that the body of the Titan is not actually being created. It is in fact Luke himself. Luke being the body for Kronos. It was genuinely a surprise to me. I expected that maybe Kronos would rise and Luke would change his mind and I feel like that still might happen where Luke will fight back against Kronos is really really tragic and I feel really bad for Annabeth who this whole time has been trying to get Luke to come back. Percy and Annabeth reunite with Tyson and Grover where they find Pan is now dying. Pan tells Grover that he is now responsible for sharing the spirit of the wild among the other satyrs. But they first must make their way back to camp where they have to fight off against Kronos' armies in one massive battle. There's something so cute about Poseidon coming to Percy's birthday party, even if it was just a talk about what happened in the labyrinth and like what's gonna happen going forward. And him telling Percy that he's his favorite son. That is the end 
of the Battle of the Labyrinth. I think this is actually probably my favorite of the series so far. Earlier ones were very episodic, and even though there was a little bit of that in this book, it did feel like there was a little bit more carryover. We get to see kind of Nico's redemption and there is that forgiveness there. I think it was very exciting and really like tense at times. The battles of course were amazing. A lot of stuff that was set up earlier in the series really pays off in this book. Ah yes, we're starting with a map, the best way for any book to make its way into my heart. The Last Olympian throws us right into the action, with Percy and Beckendorf going onto the cruise ship to try and blow it up to stop all of Kronos' monsters. But things go terribly wrong when Percy has to fight Kronos and Beckendorf ends up sacrificing himself in the explosion to stop them. I gotta be honest, I don't know why Beckendorf isn't a more well-known character. I feel like my favorite characters have been the ones that haven't gotten a lot of attention because I love Tyson and I had never even heard of Tyson before I read these books. Beckendorf sacrifices himself for the cause. He's just always been super helpful. He's always been, you know, on the ball of getting things done. I'm gonna miss him. One of the things that Rick Warden does which fascinates me is the way that he balances the destruction with the beauty. We are first introduced to Poseidon's castle through Percy and it's a beautiful thing, but then we turn to see the war going on and how it's terribly aging Poseidon. Percy begins to think about all the demigods who have been brainwashed by Kronos who are going to be killed in this terrible fight and we realize the stakes of this entire book. There's a part where Percy is looking at this mosaic on the wall depicting this big battle and he says this line that really stuck out to me, which is, it seems so easy when it was just a picture. And I feel like that's an incredible thing for Rick to do because a lot of times I feel like these sort of middle grade novels that have these fantasy battles really don't focus on the true horrors of war and of battle and, and death and destruction and it's just sort of like a thing that happens and they don't really think about the impact of that. Oh, Annabeth ran in right behind him and I'll admit my heart did a little relay race in my chest when I saw her. That's so cute. It is such a slow burn with these two, but it's so satisfying. Percy gets to camp and it is not good news. There's a spy in their midst, everyone is fighting amongst themselves, Annabeth is angry with him, Grover's gone missing, and the Titan Typhon has been making his way across America as a natural disaster storm, and all the gods are busy fighting him. However, it turns out that Nico has a plan, and it involves him and Percy going to talk to Luke's mom, Mae Castellan, who they discover has been terribly cursed by her ability to see through the mist. After this moment, they meet Hestia, who quickly becomes my new favorite goddess, and they end up going to see Percy's mom as well to get her permission for what their plan is. Can I just say, I still love Sally Jackson. She is amazing. She is an incredibly strong woman. The fact that she definitely does not agree with whatever this plan that Percy and Nico have is, we still haven't been told what this plan is. She trusts Percy. She knows that Percy is a good kid and i think it's really sweet also i'm getting worried because the fact that they got her blessing like luke's mom gave her blessing makes me think that percy is going to become a vessel for a god or a titan and that makes me concerned after this they head down to the underworld where percy discovers that this plan was actually just a ruse as hayes wanted to trap percy so that his son could take his place as a child from the prophecy. Nico helps Percy escape from Hades dungeon and the two of them go to the river Styx where Percy dips himself into the water to get Achilles curse. The adorable thing is that he uses his thoughts of Annabeth as a tether to the real world. The Vidani gods then make their way to Olympus to warn them about the trap that is coming only to be told by Hermes that they already know that a trap is coming and that the demigods are going to be the ones that have to defend Olympus and Manhattan. Hestia also reveals to Percy the moment that Annabeth met Luke and Talia to give him a little bit more perspective about how hard this moment will be for her. Okay, things are getting to the final climax of the series, it seems like. The fight has just begun. Percy was finally able to use that sand dollar his father gave him to get the 
the rivers, the Hudson River and the East River to sink all the ships for him. I love when they have these like things that are set up earlier and you don't really understand what's gonna happen there and then it pays off in the end. It seems like we're gonna get into like a big combat section next. Rick Royden's action sequences are so good. The battle begins and Percy faces off against the Minotaur, but Annabeth gets mortally wounded when she instinctively protects his weak spot. What I think is interesting about this moment is that we're really setting up the potential for Percy to lose his mind and just go crazy on these monsters. We've already set up that his weakness is his personal loyalty, and now that he's completely invincible, I'm really interested to see how this could have a downside for him. Percy, Talia, and Grover go to some peace talks with Prometheus, a representative from Kronos' side, who tries to convince them to give up by telling Percy that Hermes knew that Luke was going to turn evil this whole time and did nothing to stop it. In a dream that night, Percy discovers the truth about Mae Castellan's curse, that she tried to become the Oracle and that is what drove her crazy. Then he has to fight a giant flying pig, yeah I know, this book is all over the place. And finally, he's told by Mr. D that the reason that no one is helping is that the demigods and the mortals have to prove that Manhattan is worth saving. I think my prediction about Rachel being really important is finally coming true because she's come to Manhattan to warn Percy about this thing that she saw. She's been having these visions, she's been writing these things in ancient Greek. We've been talking about, about the Oracle a lot with May Castellan and the curse that Hades put on the oracle and I think that that means that Rachel is going to become the new oracle. The message that Rachel came to bring was the vision that she had to tell Percy that he is not the hero. We then have a moment where Selena Beauregard, the daughter of Aphrodite and former girlfriend of Beckendorf, shows up pretending to be Clarice to lead the Ares cabin to fight against the dragon. She unfortunately falls in battle and Clarice ends up killing the dragon as revenge. This is also the moment where we find out that she was the spy who was revealing information to Kronos' army. This book is called The Last Olympian and we just got the title of this book when Percy takes the pithos that has hope in it, Pandora's box, and he gives it to Hestia. Hestia, I said, I give this to you as an offering. The goddess tilted her head. I am the least of the gods. Why would you trust me with this? You're the last Olympian, I said, and the most important. And why is that, Percy Jackson? because hope survives best at the heart. I said earlier in this book, when we met Hestia for the first time, that I actually really, I liked her a lot when we first met her. I, I thought she was such a different character than the rest of the gods that we'd met. Now I see why. I love that we're giving hope to the goddess of the hearth, the one who tends the fires, the one who doesn't seem important, who doesn't fight. And I think that's an incredible message to be giving, especially after Percy just got that message from Rachel that he's not the hero, that it's not always necessarily about fighting, that there is sort of that hope in just holding down the fort and providing comfort. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover face off in Olympus against Kronos and the turned demigod Ethan Nakamura. They are able to convince Ethan to turn on Kronos, but he is defeated. And finally, they face off against Kronos, who almost wins, but Annabeth sees something in him and convinces Luke to fight back. I... I'm so not okay. <laughs> the fact that Luke gets to be the hero in the end. The fact that Luke is the one to kill Kronos because he knows where his weak spot is. He is the one who saves the day. I think is such, such a beautiful moment. I'm gonna cry. But I was saying before that I thought, you know, Luke is gonna be like, try to fight back against Kronos. He's gonna regret it. But when I had heard the prophecy that Percy isn't the hero. I thought maybe like, oh, maybe Anna Beth is the hero. And in a way she is, because she's the one who's able to get through to Luke. But the fact that it's Luke, oh my gosh, Rick Royden is so good at setting things up and just surprising you. With the battle concluded, our heroes are rewarded and Percy is offered the chance at immortality. But instead, he asks for the minor gods to be recognized and for all the children of the gods to be determined and told who their godly parent is. Rachel becomes the oracle and she gives a new massive prophecy, which I suspect is setting up the next series. Okay, so that is the la end of The Last Olympian. And with that, that means that I have officially finished reading the Percy Jackson series. Percy Jackson and the Olympians is a book series that is impossible to ignore. 
Even before reading the books or watching the movie and show, I had heard of the characters and seen the impact that it has had on my generation and YA literature in general. This series is incredibly well written, with amazing fight scenes and unique and complex characters. The main characters are complicated, imperfect people with different struggles and motivations that means that anyone can find a character that they relate to. Even the smallest characters, like Selena Beauregard, are given complex motivations and choices. This series treats its readers with such respect by covering complicated topics such as mental health, arms dealing, death, the horrors that people will commit in the name of religion, and the horrors of war. And it remains appropriate by viewing them through the lens of a fantasy world and including moments of humor as well. But the thing that impresses me the most about this series is a focus on love, forgiveness, and mercy. Percy's love for his mother, his love for his friends, and the forgiveness he shows for those that hurt him, Clarice, Nico, Selena, Luke. This series was a roller coaster. It made me laugh, it made me cry, and most importantly, it made me think. Everyone should read Percy Jackson and the Olympians, not just because of the complex characters, the great writing, or the amazing world building, but because it shows us that even when things seem darkest, with love and forgiveness, you can find the light and comfort of a hearth.